G'day fans and welcome back to another exciting episode of Nerdy Things from Another World. Yes, it's that wonderful podcast where we focus on sci-fi movies, TV shows and occasionally Australian sci-fi fandom. Uh, my name is Dags and with me is my co-host who is just so cool that did you know that at a group camping event way back in the early 90s where everyone had pitched tents for the night he actually played a kickstart my heart by motley crew in his car really loud early in the morning and it woke everyone up because surprise surprise the car wasn't soundproof yes it's jeff <laughs> oh yes that car was not soundproof and i really did think it was so uh I always got to kick up the butt from uh, many people for uh, playing it that loud. Yeah, so for those who are wondering, uh, um, Jeffro didn't actually partake in cornflakes and rice bubbles for his breakfast. He said a bit of Motley Crue, kickstart my heart, was his wake-up coffee in the morning. Is that right? That's exactly right. And it did the trick for me. And it seems that everyone else, thank you very much. Yeah, and luckily for me, I slept right through it, so clearly it didn't push my buttons. But, uh, yes, I did wake up in the morning and go, where did Jeffro go? Oh, he's in the, in the bad books. Unbelievable. It's one of those you-had-to-be-there moments. Speaking of places you had to be, uh, as people would have realised, last week that Jeffro was absent because he was on a boat cruising around with the Disney thing. So, dude, give us a five-second summary. How is the old Disney cruise for you? Disney Cruise is a, a real experience. I mean, if you've ever been on a, a cruise, then a lot of the same elements are in place. So you've got shows, you've got uh, quizzes, you've got uh, lovely, fantastic food, but they bring it all on with an extra touch with all the uh, the Mickey Mouse and Disneyland themes. They have characters that you can meet sort of on multiple occasions, and they also step it up just to the next level with their shows and uh, their service so i couldn't be more happy with going on that cruise you missed the joke there dude you could have just said oh mate it was mickey mouse <laughs> oh. <laughs> now i heard a rumor that you went to a star wars trivia quiz and you came second is that right that's true and i think the guy that uh, actually won it must have gone to the same trivia quiz earlier and noted all the answers down because this guy got 19 out of 20 and i just thought this is, I mean, he was good, but uh, I thought I was, you know, better. But uh, obviously, a better man won, and I just had to uh, suck it up. Yeah, pathetic, dude. You're absolutely shameful. You do realise that coming second just makes you the first loser. Because <laughs> uh, if those who don't know, the Dags was actually on a cruise ship, not a Disney one. They did actually have a Star Wars quiz, and this little daggy came in first place by myself. Thank you very much. 19 out of 20. So uh, how good was that? Well, what can I say? I, I'm not to your uh, level, but uh, I, I think coming in second is uh, a pretty fine effort. Uh, hang on, I can hear the crowds outside. They're going, pathetic! <laughs> anyway, uh, we've got to move on with this wonderful episode. And of course, uh, we've got to actually have a bit of a, um, uh, a letter of comment, as is often the case every week. We get someone writing in a letter of comment for this particular episode, and we've got yet another one that has come through. So, Jeffro, who has written their letter of comment, and what does it say? Yes, we have a letter from a, uh, a gentleman. I hope I pronounce his name right. It's Michael J. Calamop. So, uh, Michael J. Calamop has said, <laughs> "Dear nerds, when it comes to collecting, do you have any good or bad stories to share?" Who the hell's Michael J. K. L. M. N. What? <laughs> oh, see, is that the letters of the alphabet, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Jeez. You've been away on Disney Cruise and you still can't think of anything more original. So there you go. Um, all right. So collecting stories. Well, the funny thing about uh, Jeff and myself is that uh, we both have actually been collectors uh, in our time. I stopped 20-something years ago, 25 years ago, but you've continued on. And there's probably a lot of stories that can be shared, both good and bad. So, uh how do you want to kick this off, old son? What uh, what stories have you got to uh, pass on? Well, I've got some beauties, and and probably the top of the uh, list was there was a time where I was uh, doing some op shopping, and uh, I thought I'd really love a, a hat, so I, I sort of picked up a uh, hat and tried it on, and it wasn't uh, fitting. So there was another hat that was next to it, and it fit really nice, and I thought, okay, this is really good. I love the style, you know. I'm going for that uh, that that look, and it wasn't until after I took it home that I looked at it properly 
and I say properly, only to notice that this was a hat issued back for the movie Goldfinger from James Bond. So it was like a 1960s uh, James Bond uh, merchandise hat, and it was really nice, and it had a um, 007 uh, pin on the side, and it was um, embroidered with gold inside, and it's like I completely missed it when I was actually looking at the hat. I just thought it was a nice hat. So that was a really big score. That is a find and a half. And, yeah, there would be scenarios like that where you've just found things in the wild. That's the terminology that people use, and they've scored absolutely fantastically. But you've actually sort of been um, doing this, as I said, a lot longer, but with a bit more variety. So just give us a quick rundown as to uh, what you've, um, what your focus is or has been and is currently regarding collectibles. Well, I've collected a lot of things, um, and my current focus is um, collectible and limited edition movie and television uh, issues on uh, DVD and uh, Blu-ray. And there was one that I got uh, that uh, is a bad collecting story, and it was a uh, what they call a steel cover uh, version of a movie. And it was a collectible, and I'm thinking, this is really great. I'm looking forward to this. But lo and behold... Just when you thought the post office could not really damage a steel cover, boy, oh, boy, did they put a big dent in that. So uh, that was a really bad uh, collecting story because I couldn't return it because uh, I'd bought it on sale and there was no returns. But um, I was crushed. There would be a lot of stories I can imagine that people have regarding buying things online, on the internet, things that have to be delivered and they turn up damaged or they're not exactly what they thought they were going to be. I know you got caught out once, if I recall. Um, It was a Captain Scarlet DVD set or something else, and you thought it was like an original release issue, and you actually ordered it and got turned up, and you actually had it in your collection already. Um, Is that true? Do you remember? Do you know what I'm talking about? That does happen where you sort of uh, think you're buying something and, and only to find out that you've actually got it. I particularly had that happen a lot on books, so I, I've had a lot of books where I've sort of thought, oh, this is great, I'm going to buy that, only to find out I've got a second copy. Yeah, actually, that that's happened to me when I was in, the, in America in 1993 because that was when I was right in the, in the middle of my Batman collecting and I came across a loose Batman uh, action figure, you know, doll thing of some sort, and I thought, oh, this is absolutely fantastic. And I get home and I've got a mitten box one sitting on the shelf. I was like, <laughs> freaking idiot. <laughs> so that wasn't very, very good. Um, so... One of the things that I do get to see, because I spend a bit of time um, hanging out at a friend of ours called Aaron Challenger, who runs his own collectible store called Aaron's Collectibles in Blackburn, uh, Melbourne. And even though I'm no longer a collector, it is interesting to see the people who come in and what they're looking for, what they're buying, and the things that really get him in a bit of a tiz. And there's a lot of situations where somebody will come in and hold items and they go, oh, you know, I really want this. Do I get it now? Do I get it next week? Whatever else. And the amount of scenarios where someone has said, no, I'll come back and get it next week. And, of course, the next week it's been picked up by somebody else. Would you have been in that situation before where you've been in stores and are you thinking, oh, yeah, I'll, I, should, I'll, I'll, I can't afford it now. I've got an excuse. I can't pick it up at the moment. I'll get it next time. And it's gone walkies the next time you've been around. Oh, absolutely. I remember uh, there was a, um, a Moonbase Alpha model kit that was in a store called Hearn's Hobbies. And I just didn't have the money for it. And I, I saved up and I saved up and I went back and, and it was gone. And there was another time where our local hardware store, when things like these existed, that had a Joe 90 um, car that was in the uh, the window. And I just drooled over that every single day. I'd walk past it and look at it and go, I'd like to have that. But uh, this is when uh, I was probably earning like, you know, the dollar pocket money, if at best. So it was really out of my my budget and I remember one day it disappeared and I thought I was really hoping that I'd be the one that would eventually get that but uh, uh, someone else uh, obviously earned more pocket money than I did. Jeez that's got to suck doesn't it eh? So when I was collecting my uh, Batman merchandise I was kind of lucky because I actually stopped before eBay became a thing. Um, how did you find when eBay became the, the go-to place for buying collectibles? Did you find you couldn't control yourself? Were you going on to sp- typing in space 1999 and 6,000 items would turn up and you just go, my God, I'll buy every one of them? How did it work for you? I was very aware of my budget, so I realised that there was just some things, in, some things I just couldn't look for because I knew that uh, I wouldn't be able to, uh, to buy them. So uh, eBay was nice. And I got a lot of cool uh, DVDs and, and things like that. But uh, it 
I was very conscious not to um, go crazy on it, and I didn't. You're pretty lucky because I found that uh, I did buy a couple of Batman items from eBay in the mid two thousands, and uh, I liked them and I enjoyed them. That was great. And then one day, because I used to like uh, getting food collectibles, I looked up uh, Batman corn chips uh, in the US, and I found a packet of corn chips. So the actual chips were Batman orientated, and they, they were shaped like Batman logos and whatever. Then I found a box of them, and I thought, oh, that looks grouse, a whole box of Batman corn chips, like six bag, bags in the box. And I was one inch away from pressing buy it now, and I can't remember how much it was, probably 100, 200 bucks, whatever. And I thought, no, I can't do that. I don't even collect anymore. So um, that was a moment I had a real, like, you know, like everything sort of froze up, and I had to disconnect the computer and pull out the power leads and all sort of business because I was almost ready to head down a dark path. And I can imagine that all, a lot of people – being in that situation where they look up something on eBay and you go, oh, my goodness, all this stuff, which was once never available in this country, is suddenly everywhere. It's all available at my fingertips. And uh, I can imagine a lot of budgets being absolutely smashed to pieces by people saying, I can't control myself. I've just got to buy it now. I mean, decades have passed since eBay came into being, and I don't know if things have changed, but there would be a lot of people out there now who would uh, struggle to contain themselves. And uh, you've done well being able to uh, keep it all under control. Well, the thing that I haven't done so well is uh, on eBay selling. Like I've had a couple of times where I've had some really bad experiences. Uh, for example, uh, I sold off uh, some Star Trek Next Generation figures and I sold one off and then I get this message back saying, thank you very much. You've sold me the rare variant data. And I'm going, hey, what? And I didn't know, honestly, there is um, apparently a, a rare version of data that uh, that I had that I just sold off for a regular price. It's very funny because I've been involved in producing a documentary on Star Trek action figures from the 1990s. I now know, whereas once previously I had no idea, it's called the red data from the, uh, the episode Redemption. So that's probably the data you're talking about. So uh, there you go. So I do learn something from these shows that I put together. But you are right. I mean, it's, it's a hit and miss business no matter what. Uh, sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. I mean, I remember I was walking down the street one day when during my Batman collecting days. And, of course, you're a bit like me probably when you're out walking in the streets because, you know, this is before the internet, you're on the hunt on a regular basis. Your eyes were always looking for that one thing in the wild. You go, oh, my goodness, I haven't got that. I've never even seen it before. And I walk past a store and I'll tell you what, I mean, in the back wall, like miles from the front door, the eye saw it straight away. And, of course, the Batman logo just stands out like you wouldn't believe. And it was a cooking apron. So the idea was you hang the apron around your neck when you're cooking like a barbecue, and it's the torso of Batman, right? And I saw it from a mile away, and I go, oh, I've got to have that. And I ran into the store, and it was right down the back, right? Sure enough, that was a win. And uh, there were scenarios like that where you just come across things when you least expect it. And that was the thing mm -hmm. that kind of freaked me out. It's when you least expect it. It's one thing to say, I'm going into a collectible store, or I'm going into a bookshop or whatever. You're expecting to find things. It's when you don't expect to find them, things. That's when you know you've done well, like as you said with the with the uh, gold finger cap. So uh, I think everyone has stories like that. But by the same token, you know, it, it could have been a different scenario. You could have walked into that store. You've turned left. Someone else has turned right and walked, bought the gold finger cap before you. And there's there as you're walking past them, they go, ah, that looks awesome. Yeah, and, you, and you've missed out. So that kind of thing would happen all the time. I, I did have my moment exactly like that. And uh, take me back to when I was about uh, 16 or 17 and I was riding a bicycle because I didn't have a car. And I'm just riding down the street and out of the corner of my eye, I catch something. And instinctively, I just slammed on the brakes reversed it up and what there was in the shop window of just a general knickknack uh, shop was a box of the Mattel Moonbase Alpha. I couldn't believe it. It's like, what's that doing there? And it's literally, I was just riding past and I, I just caught something out of the corner of my eye and that was it. So uh, I was the happiest camper of the, uh, of the day to be able to go in and purchase that and I've still got it. Which is a very, very groovy old son. And, uh, and of course, you got into the pop vinyl, collecting them for a little bit there as well. So you still getting those at all? Or have you had enough of those? Pop vinyls are uh, one where I think where my space to be able to store them is very limited. So I will only buy uh, one that I really, really have to have. Like the most recent one was one for Janice Joplin. I'm a big Janice Joplin fan. And to see something for her 
I mean, I couldn't couldn't pass it up. I had to get that. Mate, space should never be a problem. Just take a leaf out of Star Trek's book because space is the final frontier. Absolutely fantastic. Um, and it's kind of interesting because I've had people ask me, it's like, oh, can I give any advice to people who are going to start collecting something? And I go, uh, don't. <laughs> I think the best thing is just don't start because it is definitely a rabbit hole that even some rabbits are afraid to go down. Um, and keep in mind, uh, sometimes going the smaller things is definitely the way to go, as I used to use as a, as a good analogy, a $40,000 stamp collection takes up way less space than a $40,000 toy collection. So, uh, yeah, don't be one of those people say, I live in a one-bedroom unit. I'm now collecting, um, you know, like one-twelfth scale statues or something because that is never going to end well. So, uh, yes, if you've got room in your place to put these things, that's great. But if you don't, then it will cause you issues before long. What do you think? I think you're definitely right because I know some people that collect those big uh, – uh, sideshow uh, action figures and uh, the hot toys. And my goodness, they do take up uh, room. And this particular person I'm thinking of has virtually lost most of his lounge room because he's put in display cases. So there's not really that much um, room for them to actually socialise in because these massive great big cases are uh, taking up his lounge room. And that's only because the spare bedroom that he had is already full of this stuff. Yeah, exactly what I was covering off a few moments ago. And it's kind of funny because of a lot of the large statues now, and I see this in Aaron's store when I'm there, uh, the boxes they come in are gigantic. They look like the size of a small fridge in some occasions. And uh, I remember when they had a really large Batmobile from the 1989 movie. Uh, I don't know who's produced it, but it's like a really big version. And the box it came in was so big, I actually said to people, if you put legs on it, you can make a coffee table out of it. Just the box. So absolutely fantastic. Um, so if people want to see more about what's going on in the world, uh, you can actually, um, for myself, from the Batman side, because I have my own web page, you can either uh, just Google Darren Daggs Maxwell or you can even Google the Jeffro page and just click on the link right at the very, very, very bottom because I do actually have some stories I can share, some music anecdotes, and I'll just leave you uh, with this tantalising one. Um, when I was going out with a girlfriend in 2006, uh, Batman Cookies came out. There were two boxes. I bought one box. She bought me the other box. Uh, it was absolutely fantastic. Went in the collection untouched, of course, unopened. And, of course, when we broke up, out of fit of spite, I opened up the box and ate all the cookies and bought another box to replace it. <laughs> oh, i got to love those stories. So there's more of those uh, if you want to go and check those out. So um, so that's the collecting story from our point of view. So Jeff Rowe, who wrote that wonderful letter uh, into the show? Because I, I know that you're going to really enjoy me being able to say that was done by Michael J. XKMLP. <laughs> <laughs> Let me try that again. I'm waiting for the day when you got, oh, we've got this fantastic uh, guy who's joined us. He used to be a radio DJ in the 1980s, and it's called uh, Michael J. Fox FM. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that would be too niche. That'd be too niche. Oh, geez, unbelievable. So there you go. Very, very cool. Anyway, so we're going to move on to our uh, topic for this evening, and, of course, it's a very good one. Well, Jeffro, what are we talking about tonight, mate? Yeah, we're going to be talking about sci-fi television and in particular the iconic sci-fi scenes that uh, made a particular episode sort of uh, memorable and famous and that we remember for uh, years afterwards hopefully well yeah it's interesting because like you know when you look at sci-fi tv there's hundreds of thousands of hours worth it, uh, of it you know, that's been produced over the years and that's only just like the american and the english side but you will have those moments that people will go oh my god everybody remembers that and of course the thumbnail for this episode uh of course came from v when you had diana eating the hamster and of course it was a hamster not a mouse a lot of people think it's a mouse or a rat no it's a hamster Right, Stephen ate the uh, ate the mouse, but that was a moment in TV history when you go, "Oh my God, I did not see that coming." And I think that's one of those things. It's the equivalent of your Empire Strikes Back, you know, you know, Vader being Luke's father scenario, and I think that's something that is sort of stuck in people's minds for decades. And if they remember anything about that particular series, they always remember that. But you're a bit of more of a TV aficionado than I am. So, uh, what moments have stuck in the mind for you? Well, I tend to think that our moments come in different sorts. So I looked at situations where we experience fear. There was other situations where there's been betrayal. Uh, there's moments where there's been excitement and there's, and there's other things as well. But 
if I go back to fear, uh, one of the uh, iconic moments I remember from the Twilight Zone was a story called uh, Time Enough to Last. And it had Burgess Meredith, who was a bookworm, who really just didn't want to be able to sort of associate with people. He just wanted to, to go somewhere and be left alone. And that's what he did. He went into a, uh, a vault and the vault shut and there was uh, a worldwide sort of uh, explosion and everyone was dead. So when the vault actually opened, he was the happiest person in alive because he was alone. That's what he wanted. And he was a book lover and he had all the books that he possibly wanted to read. And it wasn't until he was reaching over to grab one of those books that he tripped, his glasses fell off, they broke, and effectively he was blind. And it's like that just, I don't know, because I love books and I wear glasses. So that sort of maybe resonated with me, but that I thought was just such a, a powerful um, scene for that uh, story to end on. Yeah, it's funny with the Twilight Zone because they had so many twist endings. Uh, I know when we were uh, taking notes for this particular episode, I thought an iconic scene from the Twilight Zone, and there's a bit of a list of them, but the thing that stuck out for me was the Nightmare at 20,000 Feet when William Shatner, in this case, opens up because uh, he's seeing Gremlin on the wing of the plane, and, of course, this was covered off in Twilight Zone, the movie. And when he opens up the um, the blind on the plane window, you've got the gremlin just outside the window. And this is the fear thing again because he's seeing something that nobody else is seeing. And even though it was done in the 50s and maybe a little bit sort of uh, archaic by today's standards, the feeling would have still been the same no matter what, not knowing mm -hmm. what's going on. And you're seeing something that nobody else is seeing and, no, of course, nobody believes you. So with The Twilight Zone, there was a lot of episodes where they had iconic moments because – of um, those big, fantastic twist endings. So, uh, yeah, and I remember that episode that you were talking about, yeah, Time Enough at Last, and uh, and I thought, yeah, when he broke his glasses, I go, oh, that's just so, <laughs> so bad. But uh, that's what made it memorable. That's like the kind of thing when you go, is it the happy ending? Yes. Oh, no, it's, <laughs> no, it's not. Absolutely fantastic. And the other thing, too, with the uh, Nightmare at 20,000 Feet, I had a look at that uh, again today. And there's no music uh, because, you know, music tends to sort of lead you into what's going to come next. So it was very much, um, he wasn't expecting it. There's no music that allows the audience to expect it. But suddenly there's faces there in the window and they zoomed up really close. And, and it was it took us aback watching it because it said we, we weren't prepared for it. And because it was so close, you know, it really does um, give you a shock and you do remember it. Absolutely fantastic. What else you got in your list, old son? Well, one of the uh, other iconic things is um, the BBC's version of the Triffids. And in terms of fear, I remember um, watching that and just seeing everyone walking around the streets because they are blind. And you can feel that, you know, if you were in that situation, what would it be like? Because there's no one to help you. And I just thought it was so iconic to see a, a literally, you know, streets full of these people walking around trying to make their way somewhere where it was safe. That was another um, iconic fear moment for me. Yeah, that's that's kind of very, very freaky indeed. And, uh, yes, you'd be thinking, mate, there's just nowhere to turn. There's just no solution for it. There's no fix. There's nothing. So that would sort of leave That's a huge side of paranoia to a large degree. So, yeah, yep, totally agree with you. And with the um, other category I was looking at, uh, betrayals, there's been some very good betrayals where, you know, sort of a, a good guy suddenly becomes bad or someone backstabs somebody. And there's been some great uh, examples of that in science fiction. So one of the um, main highlights of Star Trek Next Generation, and as soon as I mention this, uh, people go, oh, of course, yes, uh, best of both worlds, where we uh, have Picard abducted. And next thing you know, he's on a big screen saying he's Locutus of Borg and prepare for a simulation. I mean, what a moment uh, that was. And I mean, it still resonates through the uh, the new series that's come out. So they even uh, reference that. It was such a uh, iconic moment and uh, nobody ever forgets that. Yeah, it was good, wasn't it? So it was Best of Both Worlds Part 1. And some people actually said it should have been a film. It was that good. And of course, that comes under the heading of when Picard has turned into Locutus and you go, so how are they going to fix this? 
<laughs> like, how's he going to get out of this? Um, and, and there are a lot of TV series where the uh, cliffhanger ending just really, really resonates with a lot of people. And they go, oh, my God, I can't wait for the next season. In some instances, the writers probably haven't even figured out what the solution is yet to the problem. But of the seasons that uh, made um, Next Generation sing, it was definitely that one. And you are right. Uh, I don't think in terms of Star Trek finales for all the shows and all the seasons, that is definitely right up there towards the top. And, uh, yes, he's the cutest of Borg. And you go, mate, you guys are so juicy. This is the Federation. You guys are so juicy-fruited. <laughs> and that was absolutely fantastic. It's kind of funny because uh, from a Star Trek side, I actually had one that I remember because I was actually watching this with a group of people. Uh, and this was from Deep Space Nine. And, of course, in Deep Space Nine, they discover the wormhole, which connects to the Gamma Quadrant. And uh, as a starship that goes through there, the, uh, the Odyssey, the USS Odyssey, which was a galaxy-class starship, the same as the Enterprise D, and, of course, there's been all these references to the Dominion and the Jem'Hadar, and nobody knows anything about them. And I was actually in the room with a whole bunch of fans watching this when the Jem'Hadar attacked the Odyssey and actually blew it up. And it was quite – that was a real moment where everybody just froze because the destruction of a galaxy-class starship just does not happen. And this unknown alien who we've never seen before, we don't know who they are, the Jem'Hadar, um, destroyed that ship. That was something that I remember. So, uh, yeah, from a Star Trek side – yeah, that was a bit of a big deal. And, of course, when you're seeing these things with a lot of people, you can actually really have a whole sense of, like, wow, we did not see that coming, So, uh, which was very, very groovy. But uh, now getting back to what you said with Lakuta Sabor, absolutely fantastic. So, yeah, very cool. They do tend to save the most iconic uh, scenes for final episodes, and no better case in point is Blake Seven's final ever episode, and this is where we get to see the return of Blake uh, because Avon has been leading the crew for um, a couple of seasons. But it ended with something that we weren't expecting, and that is no spoilers, uh, hopefully, for uh, people that haven't uh, seen it. Dude, it was 40 years ago. If you haven't seen it now, you're never going to see it. But um, where it's very emotional because Avon thinks he's been betrayed by Blake, and, and Blake's not helping himself by... Um, and inuring and trying to sort of say, no, no, you got it all wrong. And then we see um, Tarrant say he did betray us, and that was enough for Avon to actually shoot Blake. And it was, I mean, it's it's gut-wrenching. Then not only after that, to be able to see in slow motion all the other crew finally mowed down by Federation troops until Avon's the one that's left, and he's surrounded by troops. And then they just black it out and all you hear is gun blasts and you just don't know what's happened and your imagination is just going off the charts with what you think's happening and i mean uh, in terms of a final episode for any show i mean you can't get much better than that in terms of drama and tension and, and excitement you know what i never watched blake seven but even i remember that uh it was like wow they're actually killing off all the other characters and you are right, it just fixates on Avon, and I think he smiles before they cut the black, because you know, the guy never smiled. And, mm. yeah, you don't know really know what happens. But I thought, what a way to finish the show off. They just clearly said, yep, it's been a dark series the whole way through. It has um, tension throughout the entire story. In the end, the bad guys have to win because that just justifies everything that's been occurring rather than going for the Hollywood ending and saying, no, no, they all live happily ever after. And if you're living in an environment which is just surrounded by um, persecution and, and being chased by the government, as it were, ultimately it's going to end badly for you. And, uh, and yeah, I, mean, I remember that. And it's was like, wow, that is going to leave a mark. And, uh, yeah, it was very, very well done. And kudos to them for doing it too. So, uh, so yeah, I even had Blake Seven's final moments um, listed down, even though it's a show I never really watched. But I do remember that. So, yeah. Uh, very, very cool. And we have lots of uh, uh, examples where there's been some uh, excitement in a, in a show. And the one that immediately sprung to mind, of course, being Jerry Anderson, is uh, the first story that they did for Thunderbirds, Trapped in the Sky. So we have the fire flash and it is not able to land because the wheels can't be uh, brought down. So the Thunderbirds team are brought in to try and save the, um, the plane. So they bring in these elevator cars, and the idea is that the plane will lower itself down enough that the 
actual wings and the actual uh, nose of the plane will rest on the elevator cars. But it's not as easy as it looks. And one of the actual elevator cars uh, is struggling and then it blows a tire. And I remember when I was watching this as a kid, I'm going, I can't stand it. What's going to happen? And it's just the tension of then um, uh, having them go a second time because the plane had to sort of take off because one of the elevator cars had sort of swerved off. And in real life, what happened was when they were filming it, that was just an accident. And they said, let's keep that in and make sure that we can then um, have the plane go for a second attempt. So when it does go for a second attempt, the elevator cars put their brakes on, they're wobbling. Uh, the plane has uh, a bomb in it, so we don't want uh, it to sort of crash and explode. And it was like such tension in that uh, uh, episode that uh, it's one of the best Thunderbird stories that uh, Jerry Anderson fans will always quote that one uh, particularly. That is absolutely very, very groovy. And fast forwarding about 20, 30 years, you've got something from Babylon 5 you wanted to bring up. Now, Babylon 5... They were the cutting edge of uh, computer graphics on television. And there's nothing better when you get to see a huge space battle. And they did that in one of their movies called Third Space, where you literally had all the ships sort of uh, flying around, shooting, attacking each other. And the interesting thing was that uh, Sheridan was in a space suit trying to get to a location that he needed to get to. So he's sort of floating around while all these spaceships are shooting around each other and i just thought this is this is excitement this is spectacle this is the sort of thing that uh, fans do love seeing i'm going to see your third space base battle and i'm going to up the ante with something else uh, regarding babylon 5 and that of course was the arrival of the shadows uh both their ships and when they first appeared uh in a, in, in um, inverted commas in person in uh, when Morden was uh, in a cell and they just appeared out of nowhere like they've um, got a cloaking device and they just and because they're like spiders or something and it's like oh that is just absolutely freaky and of course in the I think it was the first or the second season whichever it was when the shadows are aligned with the Centauri Republic and destroy the Narn outpost I mean that was just freaky as they just turn up these spiders in space with these massive laser beams, and you are right, because it was a, a CG created show, the ships were really, really alien in design, and they looked absolutely spectacular, being all black with a bit of a shimmering effect, and of course they could just appear and disappear at will. That was freaky, and of course nobody knew who they were, where they came from, what they were, and so I would uh, argue that um, when it came to scenes in Babylon 5 that really hit home, uh, when the shadows uh, appeared in the early uh, sequences and when they are sort of like finding their place in the scheme of things was absolutely spectacular. And I think that's the kind of thing that if you ask people about Babylon 5 as to what really stuck in the minds for them, I think it's uh, as the Shadows would have to rate as one of the all-time bad guys in most TV series. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's what I remember from that series. So, yeah, very, very cool. They certainly did have that design that looked nothing like anything else that we'd seen before. And because essentially it's working on our, our fears of things like, um, you know, spiders and, and dark things and all that. So it had all those elements that just really, you know, we took it seriously. It was a scary race and we knew that they did scary stuff and their ships were scary. And it kind of worked because, as we said, because it was digitally created, they could never have done that practically, those effects with the both how they looked as as uh, organic beings as well as the ships. It was just spectacular. So it was really cutting edge and uh, absolutely fantastic. Um, it's very interesting because we got a little bit of a list here of like things that uh, were really classic moments. And this one you had listed, and I thought, I remember this, and I've actually discussed this with friends of mine, the series Galactica 80, right? Utter rubbish. But the one thing that was absolutely the winner for it is the simulation of when the Cylons attacked Earth, which is actually Los Angeles. And you get the Cylon Raiders coming down, blowing the crap out of absolutely everything, which I think actually was taken footage from taken from the movie Earthquake. But, geez, that looked grouse. By today's standards, it looks terrible. But at the time, it was like, that is awesome. That was a scene to remember. And I think everybody dolls into that out of everything from Galactica 80. you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. And particularly when there was recognisable landmarks. I mean, 
they destroy tower records. And I mean, everyone that uh, knows anything about Los Angeles uh, is familiar with that iconic tower records building. So uh, yeah, it was it was the sort of thing that we just didn't expect because we didn't expect them to make their way back to Earth. But uh, as said, it was a, a, a good fake because then it worked out that uh, no, they hadn't. Exactly right. You see in the trailer, you go, oh, that is just great. I mean, who wants to see Los Angeles be destroyed by Cylons? Yes, all, he, all his hands go up, but then it doesn't happen. Oh, it's just a simulation as to what could happen. Unbelievable. Um, and another series that was renowned for creating a really, really good sequences was, of course, The X-Files. Uh, now, you had something listed here, and I had something listed here as well, but you can go first. What from The X-Files uh, struck you as being a really, really good sequence? Well, I had the uh, episode tombs because that's the one where it deals with a um a psychotic being who actually manages to squeeze himself through uh small ventilator shafts and chimneys and and all that and and they just really ramped up the fear factor and i'm sure that uh if anyone does uh remember x files uh that'll be the one one of the episodes that they do remember yeah, I think there's a sequence in a bathroom and you've got this little tiny gap in the wall and you just see his foot go through it because he's squeezed himself out and he can just... It's like, oh, that is just... <laughs> that is just freaky to the max. And, of course, they use a special lens uh, when they showed the guy himself and they're, like, really, really long and stretched. But you are right, you know. He's like, oh, there's only a small gap there. He won't get through that. And, of course, he does. Absolutely unbelievable. It's very funny because what I had listed down, uh, and it was more of a moment than a sequence, but, it, of course, it was when uh, Deep Throat... Uh, actually got shot and killed. Uh, I think that was a season finale as well, actually, by the uh, alien bounty hunter guy. And that was one thing you didn't expect because, like, oh, my God, a major character has just been shot and killed. And I thought that was absolutely fantastic because that was something you didn't see coming. Uh, so X-Files certainly had its moments in the sun where it uh, really, really uh, shone bright. And, uh, yeah, I agree with you. I think the Tombs character actually rates highly as one of the most uh, favoured villains out of the fan um, fraternity, if I'm not mistaken. I believe you'd be right. And the other thing, too, is that Deaths uh, play some of the most uh, greatest iconic scenes in uh, a lot of television uh, shows where a selfless death is, uh, is one that's uh, remembered, for example... Earthshock, where um, Adric was uh, uh, on the board a, um, a ship and he um, needed to stop the ship from colliding into the, uh, the planet Earth and uh, he was told to get off and right at the very last minute he turned around and said, oh, I think I can stop the uh, ship and he basically uh, uh, shut himself in and um, he, he tragically died and the famous part about this one for Doctor Who was that they ran the credits with a broken badge that he would wear of his star and it was done absolutely silently. I know it's a bit of a cliche to run credits with no music, but it was terribly effective at the time. Hadrick wasn't a very popular character though, was he? He, he wasn't. So this was something that I guess uh, allowed the actor and I guess the character to have a little bit of redemption. So um, you, you do tend to remember the, the, the dead more fond than what you do when they were alive. And I guess, you know, it just meant that um, uh, he got a, uh, a farewell that uh, he could be proud of. Very, very cool. Speaking of farewells, there's a nice little segue for you. It is time for us to farewell ourselves. I hope you got some enjoyment out of our iconic um, TV sci-fi scenes. And, of course, everybody will have their favourites. And there's probably a whole lot that we've missed. But hopefully we've covered off a fair few for you that uh, you can go back and watch with great joy and delight. Any final words before we sign off for this episode, Mr. Jeffro? I absolutely agree with you. I mean, there's so many different highlights that uh, it would be lovely to mention them all, but we've only got so much time and uh, the ones we have picked, I hope, have been good representations. Absolutely fantastic. So it's time for us to buzz off. If you listen to us either on YouTube and or Spotify, because that's where we are now, uh, hope you enjoy our future episodes and the episodes we've had already. So with that in mind, party hard, rock on, and as always, make sure you... <gasps> Stay nerdy. Ciao for now. Me, 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 me. Mom, 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 mom. Mom, 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 mom.
Figaro, 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 Figaro. Guess what? I just recorded all that and I'm going to put that as a new exam the outro. <laughs>